The 2020 race for the White House is more unpredictable than ever. In a campaign already upended by the coronavirus pandemic. Dozens of ballots were thrown into a dumpster. New concern that election day could stretch well beyond November 3rd. The Economist is analyzing the latest data to cut through the noise and predict the results. You submitted your questions to Elliot Morris, our data journalist and election guru. Here are his answers. In 2016, Hillary Clinton was the favorite by a large margin. Why should we trust the data this time? That is the million dollar question, right? Uh, so polls this time should be better, but that's no guarantee. And, and there are a few reasons why that's the case. The first is the technical methodological explanation, uh, and that is that the reason that some polls were wrong, especially in the Midwest, in states like Michigan and Wisconsin, uh, was because they, they missed uh, the crucial block of non-college white voters in the electorate that support Donald Trump by a few percentage points. And the reason that's the case is because those voters are less likely to take public opinion polls than voters with a college degree who are more likely to support Democrats. This year, it seems like most pollsters are making those adjustments correctly and that the polls should not underestimate support for Trump in the same way this year uh, that they did last time around. Um, there's also uh, another consideration that might make polls better, and that's that there are fewer undecided voters in the electorate this time around. So in 2016, there was upwards of 15% of voters who said they were unlikely to vote or they, they didn't know who they were going to vote for or they were going to vote for a third party candidate. And this year, that number in total is really closer to 5%. Uh, and that makes us more confident that Joe Biden's lead in the polls is robust and, and likely to last. How many unknowns do you suspect could make election predictions inaccurate? There are a few things that could make our predictions wrong. And the first thing is obviously having to do with the polls. If they're talking to the wrong people or there's a late shift that happens after the last polls are done uh, sampling, sampling voters, then they could go awry. Uh, but this year there are also some particular problems with the pandemic. Uh, so pollsters rely on asking people if they'll actually turn out to vote. Um, and if one party is more likely to overestimate their tendency to actually vote, um, then the polls would overestimate their support. Uh, so you can imagine in a pandemic, uh, in a year where Donald Trump is uh, telling most of his voters to vote in person, that Republicans could be more exposed to uh, telling pollsters that they're more likely to vote than they really are and that could make uh, polls biased against them. Now, that's just one story, that's just conjecture, uh, but it's one potential source of error. What does voter turnout look like in the swing states? So voter turnout looks to be up pretty much everywhere. Uh, that includes in swing states and in other states. In, in some states, uh, early voting already accounts for 20% or more of total turnout in 2016, which is quite astonishing. Uh, and uh, that has downstream electoral consequences as well. So we know from past research at The Economist that when turnout is higher, that tends to benefit Democrats. And that's mainly in diverse states. So in the Sun Belt states that look competitive this year, like Arizona, uh, Texas, Georgia, and North Carolina, and to some extent Florida, which is all, always competitive, really, uh, Joe Biden has an upside and that more voters are turning out this time uh, than would have in 2016. Do you incorporate early voting into your forecasting model? Our model doesn't use early voting data and most forecasting models don't. And there are a few reasons why. The first is that it's hard to get data from each state on who exactly is casting early ballots. So some states uh, might tell you that there are Democrats and Republicans voting and this is how many ballots are coming from them, uh, but most states uh, don't. Even if a state does tell you that there are Democrats or Republicans voting, there's a difference between when somebody registers as a Democrat or Republican with the government, and they also, by the way, have the ability to register with no party in some states, uh, and how they actually vote. Uh, a recent poll in Pennsylvania, for example, found uh, that about 70% of registered Republicans were actually voting for Donald Trump, uh, which leaves about 30% who aren't. So it's just hard to guess at which partisans are going to vote 
for who. The real forecasting information uh, comes from the state of the economy and the president's approval rating. So we know historically when a president is, uh, has, has a low popularity or when the economy is uh, shrinking that they tend to do poorly in, in the election. Does your model consider high rejection rates of ballots? There are a few ways that high rejection rates of ballots could influence our predictions. Uh, now, historically, uh, there is some disconnect uh, between who people say they're going to vote for and the actual count of ballots in a state. That can explain some pollster error, of course, uh, and rejection rates is one of them. So we know in most states that uh, younger and African-American voters have their ballots rejected at higher rates, and historically, uh, that that the error caused by this dynamic is captured in our election model. Uh, but if there is a spike this year in how likely re rejections are for younger or African-American or lower income voters, that could cause further error in the model. Uh, and we know from, from separate modeling uh, that that could very well be true this year, that Joe Biden uh, could face an extra one or two percentage point drop in severe states for rejection rates, uh, just based on, uh, on slow delivery, on young people not having their signatures match up with the state file, and the, the sort of numerous other reasons for rejections. Can mail-in ballots be discarded as easily as some fear? So the, the sort of conspiracy theories about people just discarding ballots or putting them in the trash uh, are quite overblown. Those are really rare occasions that uh, don't impact a lot of votes. Uh, but there are real concerns about the ways that the laws around absentee ballots are structured in America. Um, they can have disproportionate effects, like we've talked about, for younger uh, and non-white Americans uh, who move around a lot so they don't have an address for election workers to verify, uh, or who don't have driver's licenses so they don't have signatures already in the state's voter system uh, that, that election workers use to verify absentee ballots. Uh, or in lower income areas, we know the Postal Service uh, works more slowly than it does in other areas of the country for whatever reason, uh, which could make those ballots late. Um, so, so I'm less worried about people intentionally discarding ballots, uh, and reformers are more worried about the real structural problems with the system. How long can we expect to wait for the results? So we should have a really good idea of what's going to happen uh, by around 9 or 10 p.m. Eastern time. And that's because that's when Florida should have about 90 or 95 percent of its ballots casted, at least if patterns from 2016 uh, hold true. And the reason that Florida is so important uh, is because it tells us a lot about how other states are going to vote. So the way our election model works is by uh, arranging states from left to right based off of their projected vote share, essentially. And we know if Florida is going blue, then most of the states to the left of Florida, uh, like the Midwestern states or maybe even Arizona this year, are also likely to vote for Joe Biden. So essentially, if he wins Florida, and, and we should know pretty early if he does, then he's on track to win the election. Our model would give him close to a 95% chance. You know, a, a a pretty sure thing. Uh, barring unforeseen consequences at that point, uh, we would be able to predict the result. Could one candidate appear to be winning on election night, but lose once all ballots have been counted? There's been a lot of concern this year about this so-called red mirage or blue wave effect, uh, where absentee ballots, which can sometimes take a while to count, uh, are more democratic leaning than other ballots. Uh, so the thinking goes this year that because there are going to be so many absentee ballots and because we're in a pandemic and we might have fewer poll workers, that they'll take longer to count. Uh, and that's probably true. Uh, however, uh, the, the chance for the Electoral College to flip over time, uh, but after a lot of ballots are counted, is relatively low. The economists looked at this earlier this year and found that once 80% or so of both absentee and uh, election day ballots are, are counted, then uh, the election would line up with the result. How likely are Americans to not accept the election result? And what would be the impact of this? Yeah, that's a really important question this year. When we have politicians questioning the results already, uh, it's pretty likely that citizens would do 
the same. And, and we have polls that show from YouGov uh, and from a partnership between UCLA and this uh, research organization called the Democracy Fund uh, that people are pretty likely to endorse violence or unrest if their side loses, especially in the case where they view that loss as undemocratic. Uh, so Republicans, in the case of widespread illegal voting, which, by the way, uh, we haven't ever seen evidence before um, uh, of, uh, are likelier to endorse violence against opponents or, again, widespread unrest. Uh, and Democrats are likely to do the same if there's a mismatch between the Electoral College and the popular vote, like there was last time around. Uh, but when we talk about tolerance for violence, that's also a lot different than actually going out and you know hurting your opponents. I think this is less of a concern if either candidate wins by a large amount, where you know if, if Joe Biden has the eight or nine point margin that our forecast is uh, projecting today, then it's harder to call the election in the Dow. Hi, I'm Elliot Morris, a member of The Economist's data team. With election day less than four weeks away, you can join my colleagues from our US team for a live digital event we're hosting, especially for Economist readers and viewers. We will be discussing the economic impact of the election and answering any questions you may have about the remainder of the campaign. This event is completely free. To register for it, just click on the link. Thanks for watching.